Okay, so uh, my name is David Moskowitz. I'm the founder of a site called Coin Republic, uh, where I broker Bitcoin. In other words, I buy it for you and then send it directly to your wallet. Uh, and I also recently launched the first two-way ATM in Singapore, which allows you to not only buy Bitcoin, but you can also sell your Bitcoin and get cash out of the machine. Uh, in about 20 minutes, uh, it's not a lot of time, but I'll do my best to explain a brief history of digital money, electronic money, and where we're at now. So the first question that you need to ask yourself is, what is money? And this is one of the great things about what Bitcoin is doing with people, is it's actually making them think about what money is in the greater scheme of things. So by classical definition, it's a means of exchange. Uh, you can use it to transfer value between two people. Uh, it's a store of value. Uh, this is a little bit hard to uh, know if something is a store of value without a long period of history. Uh, gold has a long-term store of value. Historically, it's, it's had value. Uh, our, our currencies, uh, maybe not so much, depending on the country that you're in. Uh, even the United States, the current currency system is only about 100 years old, so it's questionable long-term store of value of currencies. A unit of account, uh, can you do bookkeeping with it? Very easy. Uh, can you divide and transport it? So in other words, can you take a $5 bill, break it into ones or twos or whatever you use in your local currency? Uh, does it cost very little to preserve? So if you're bartering or you're using uh, cows, you can't really preserve cows as value. Uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it's difficult to keep them, and it's cost, costly to keep them. Cash, it'll sit forever as long as you, uh, you properly store it. Uh, resistant to counterfeiting. So uh, with cash currencies, uh, we have to embed certain features in them in, uh, in the modern era to prevent it from counterfeiting. With digital currencies, uh, we use cryptography, and we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, so exactly what is digital money? There's actually two ideas behind digital money. There's electronic money and digital money. Um, electronic money I would classify as money which has an existing system that it's based on. So for example, if you have a bank account and you're sending money electronically from one account to another account, traditional bank account, uh, I would classify that as electronic money. Uh, anything that is using uh, a commodity based, for example, a gold based ETF, uh, that would also, I would classify that as electronic money. And then we have purely digital money, which has no physical start to it. And these are things like our modern day cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, uh, Litecoin, uh, and other coins that we're getting out now. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm moving a bit quick because I want to get into the, the more modern usage of these things. So electronic dollars actually started out a long time ago. Uh, 1860, Western Union had all these branches all over the U.S., and they started to say to themselves, how can we, how can we make, uh, get greater value out of this? And it occurred to them that they could transfer value very easily using their existing telegraph system. So if you were in Deadwood and you wanted to transfer money into New York, you could use their system to say, uh, this person has given me $100. We need to credit their account on this side $100. So that was the first electronic system. Uh, the Federal Reserve started using magnetic reels after World War II. So a bank would put how much money it had in deposits on a magnetic reel. They would then take that to the Federal Reserve and it would be credited to their account there. Uh, Diners Club was the first one to create the credit card back in 1960. Uh, and again, these are all based on US dollars primarily. And they're also centralized. So we're going to get into why that's a problem in a moment. Uh, Sabre was a reservation system developed between American Airlines and uh, IBM to do the reservation system. And again, this is also a credit-based system. So what you're doing is you're crediting an account and you're taking money from another account. And then DigiCash in 1990. Uh, this was somewhat of the first electronic slash digital money system. Uh, the owner... Um, see if I can pronounce his name right, is David Kaum, uh, a little bit of an eccentric mathematician. And he was the first one to develop a way to send money between two people anonymously. Uh, just like I could pass cash to you, and no one outside of this transaction would know that that would happen, uh, he developed a cryptographic system 
that enabled you to do that back in 1990. Uh, it's a very interesting story. If you have a chance, you should read up on it. Uh, really w interesting story. He was offered millions of dollars for this, and he kept turning it down and turning it down. In fact, I think Microsoft may have offered him like $100 million for the idea or for, this, for the business, and he turned them down. Uh, eventually, it went bust. Uh, PayPal in 1998. Everyone, does everyone here have a PayPal account? Yeah, pretty much. OK. Alexis, you don't have a PayPal? OK. <laughs> so everyone pretty much has a PayPal account at this point. Uh, but again, it's all based on the US dollar system primarily. Uh, it's a credit-based system. So um, their accounting system is keeping track of who's sending money to who on both sides of that. Uh, then we get into electronic money based on commodities. And this is where it starts to get a little bit more interesting. So we had e-gold. Uh, created in 1996, and then they started to get into some trouble in 2007 with the, uh, the United States government, uh, claiming that there were money launderers and drug dealers and the usual story that you hear in the press. Um, it's true there were people abusing the system. Uh, eventually, I think the judge in the case, he didn't quite throw out the case, but he said, well, you know, the intention of the owners were, were not to be launderers or anything like that. Uh, here's a small fine. And I don't even think they got any jail time. I think they just got probation. But the system itself was shut down, and the government seized their gold. What they did is they had gold-based assets, and they issued um, basically certificates, electronic certificates based on these, and people were trading these as electronic currency. Uh, Liberty Reserve. Now, this was apparently primarily to launder money. <laughs> was their intention, it seems. Uh, started in 2006, established out of Costa Rica by some people who were previously convicted of money laundering. Uh, and <laughs> 2011, 2013, they got shut down uh, by the US uh, Justice Department. So floating money. Now, this is a little bit different. This is um, you separate the money from state. You separate the money from a commodity. And you create your own currency, in essence. So air miles were really the first example of this. Uh, it was completely separated from anything in existence prior. Um, and I think it's, it's closer to probably a voucher system than even digital money at that point. Uh, now, Linden dollars was a pure virtual currency. And this was established uh, in the game Second Life. And what happened is people started actually trading these for real dollars. So rather than doing the work within the game to uh, be able to buy an amulet or to, uh, you know, spending 10 hours wasn't worth your time on the game to, to build up these currency credits. So you would just pay somebody for their credits. So there started to be exchanges built around this, and it became a free-floating currency. Uh, but again, both of these are still centralized. So if Second Life goes down, um, you lose your credits, you lose your currency. If Air Miles, if American Airlines was, I, I think, one of the first ones to develop this, American Airlines goes bankrupt, which uh, I think they have several times at this point, and most of the airlines have, uh, you can lose your Air Miles. Uh, then we have Amazon and Facebook. Both of these companies have attempted to create their own currency. Uh, not so successfully yet. It's very difficult to create a, a free-floating currency. Um, you need a combination of users using it, and you need merchants taking it. Uh, it's very hard to get that network effect going. Uh, and that brings us to Bitcoin. <laughs> OK, I kind of rushed through that to get to the Bitcoin part. Um, does anybody here have an Android phone? Android phone? OK, um, can you go to Google Play? And on Google Play, type in Bitcoin Wallet. OK, and in a moment, I'm going to give away some free money to some people. OK, um, so download and install that wallet. So a brief history of Bitcoin. It was created in 2008. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, we don't know exactly who he is, or uh, it could have been an individual group, man, woman, we don't know. Uh, he wrote a white paper back in 2008 trying to solve the problem of how do you create a currency uh, without having a centralized authority behind it? And how do I transfer a digital asset from one person to another when I can't necessarily trust the people who are verifying that transaction? So in the example of PayPal, we have to trust PayPal. 
when I send money to somebody via PayPal, I have to trust that PayPal is keeping proper track of that. If PayPal goes away, my money at PayPal disappears. Okay, and I also need to be sure that when I send that digital asset, whether it be a token we call money or a token called a photo, that this object has only been sent at one time and I no longer have that asset. So the way that Satoshi Nakamoto thought of this was to create a ledger um, called the blockchain. And this is a decentralized ledger where you have multiple copies of it all over the world. Uh, so it's a peer-to-peer -peer system of decentralized trust. And yeah. Uh, Apple, you have, Apple, you have to go to, uh, you have to go to HTML and download a wallet called blockchain.info. Uh, it's actually not an app for Apple. Apple doesn't like Bitcoin. So we have some issues with that. Sorry, Apple guys. Yeah. Uh, you can still do it. You can do it using the blockchain uh, online wallet using HTML. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated. So just for this example, I'll just stick to Android so it's quick. Um, no problem, no problem at all. Uh, it's a big issue for, for, for Bitcoin, no doubt. Um, so you have this decentralized trust. And I, I, sorry if I'm rushing through this. Um, just when you think you understand Bitcoin, there's something more to it. So there, there's always more to learn about it. Um, so it's a public ledger. Um, and what we have are these miners in the background. And these are not centralized agencies. There's no central PayPal. You have individual miners. And this is a good example. So this is a little mining unit that I was given by the manufacturer. It's a USB miner. You stick it in your computer. And you add that power to the network to verify these transactions. So did anyone get the app yet? First person raises their hand. Oh, uh oh, we got three of them. OK, you three. I'll send two. Um, sorry, line of vision. So what we have here are three mobile apps. And on our app, we have something called a private key and a public key. And why don't I show you that in the next one here. So uh, how it works is if you imagine a safety deposit box in a bank. And the public key is the account number on the safety deposit box. And the private key unlocks all these different deposit boxes. So in our house, we have a room with all these, with all these locks. And we have a single key that unlocks all these boxes. And each of these numbers on the box are our public key. So someone can come, and they can stick money in each of these boxes. And then we can come, and we can unlock any of these boxes. So that's the, the basic idea of public and private key. So what you do is you send money to somebody's public key. So this way, um, anyone can, can send money to a public key but only the owner of the Bitcoin, which has this private key, can unlock it and get access to it. So you control the asset. You control your bank account. Uh, you're no longer beholden to a bank or institution to control those funds. So it's, it's a completely different model from anything we've seen before. Uh, I know it can be a little bit confusing. So the best way to show it is just to, to download the app and just do a quick send. So I'm going to send money to him. So I scanned in his public code to my wallet, and I'm going to send him a millibit. One Bitcoin? Um, one millibit. I wish. Yeah. So I'm going to send one millibit, which is about uh, 50 cents right now or so. OK. He's got seven Bitcoins, man. Oh, seven. I'm sending it to the already converted. I need some unconverted. Anyone who downloaded the app, not converted yet. OK. So I just sent that. We're having a little bit of a network issue, I think, but it should go through. Bad internet. Do you have 3G here? OK, so we can probably do it via 3G.
Always a problem with live demonstrations. Okay. So I will scan in the code here. Oh, sorry, close my app. Okay. Okay, so I scanned in the public key again. And I just type in the amount that I want to send, about 54 cents, uh, one millibit. Uh, Bitcoin is currently trading at about uh, $450 US right now, or about 550 Sing. So I transmitted it. You got it? She got it already? So that's how quick it is. And I sent it directly from my wallet to her wallet, no bank intermediary, on a completely distributed network. So if any one of those nodes go down, it doesn't matter, because you have another one doing it. Uh, a few months ago, Visa had a problem. Their entire network was down. You couldn't do a Visa transaction. So this is a way that we're able to go beyond that. Also, you don't need permission from anybody to set up one of these accounts. So if you're a charity in a jurisdiction that is not happy with you, a good example, WikiLeaks, um, was they had their funding sources, credit cards, PayPal, all that shut down by the US government. They could still take in Bitcoin. Um, if you're, so charity is a good example. If you're a merchant, um, any small business owners here who've tried to set up credit card accounts? Um, yeah, how long did it take to, to get that going? Week? Two, two days? Two weeks. Two weeks. First, you have to get a bank account, then you have to get approved by the credit card company, they, all sorts of questions. With Bitcoin, we just downloaded the app, you're in business. So it's that quick, it's that easy. Um, and you can generate a near infinite number of these public keys. So to keep your transactions private, you can generate a new one of these whenever you send and receive a transaction. So this transaction is public. In other words, it's on the blockchain. Anyone can see this information. If I want to keep that information pub private, what I do is I generate a new one, and you can only see that specific transaction. Now, as a consumer, I know that this company does not have my credit card information. We had a problem with Target a couple of months ago, where hackers got in and they stole all these a million different credit cards. I was one of them. OK. They targeted, me. they targeted you. Target targeted him. So we had a big problem with that. That doesn't happen with Bitcoin because it's a push technology. So I only send the person the information that I want to send them. They don't, they're not required to take in all this additional information from me. Um, so if you look at the token, the currency Bitcoin, this is really just the first app on it. Uh, because the protocol itself, this, this ability to, to create trustless transactions, where we have a distributed network, a timestamp network, um, that's verifying that transactions are happening, that these digital assets are passing. The first digital asset that's being sent on this is the currency, Bitcoin. Uh, but we can use it for all sorts of other things. Uh, talking about crowdfunding, uh, a company could issue shares using this system. Um, you could write smart contracts. This is, 2014 is going to be very big for the programmable aspect of Bitcoin. You can be able to write contracts. Uh, using Bitcoin. So in other words, if I wanted to create a trust for my family, I could put a certain amount of Bitcoin in that trust, and I could then program it to only release at a certain date to certain Bitcoin addresses. Um, you can do insurance policies like this. Um, I got married a few months ago, and um, what I did is I hashed a photo of my marriage certificate and submitted that to the network. So that's proof that this document, this unique document, uh, existed at this point in time. So copyright, trademarks, all that sort of stuff. If you're a writer and you want to prove the fact that you wrote that document, that you wrote that article before anyone else, you could hash that document, submit it to the network, and it's time stamped that it was sent in at this point in time. So there's a lot of uses to Bitcoin beyond uh, just money. Uh, so we have Bitcoin the protocol and we have Bitcoin the the actual uh, currency. So that, that's actually, that's pretty much it for, for the presentation. Um, so this brings us to all these alternative currencies. One thing that I forgot to mention is Bitcoin is open source. 
So anyone can go in and look at the code, verify that it's not malicious, that there's nothing in there that's going to steal your money, or, and, and uh, there's a, a large community of coders that are working on this system. Uh, but from that, we've had all these alternative currencies develop. Uh, number two in popularity, I think, is Litecoin, but Dogecoin is quickly becoming a favorite of people. Uh, in fact, they, speaking about crowdfunding, they raised $30,000 for, uh, for the Jamaican bobsled team to go to the Olympics, uh, which is a great story. Uh, probably my second favorite coin, though, is the Kanye coin. Uh, but that was shut down due to legal reasons, as you can imagine. <laughs> but uh, I love the story behind that one. That, that was just too funny not to, not to be behind. Um, but we really don't know, you know what's going to happen with all this. Um, what we do know is that this technology, this, uh, this blockchain technology, this ability to create these trustless transactions of, of transferring digital assets uh, is here to stay. It's the future of finance. It's the future of currency. Um, it's probably the future of crowdfunding as well uh, because one of the things you're going to be able to do is independently crowdfund using these systems. Uh, you may not need a centralized crowdfunding platform anymore in the future. Um, and you don't need permission in order to raise those funds. So I know on, uh, on Kickstarter, some companies have had their funds locked up by PayPal. So with Bitcoin, that doesn't happen. It's a one-way transaction. You send the Bitcoin. Once it's been deposited, once it's been transmitted, so I can't get this Bitcoin back that I sent. It's gone. It, it's in her wallet now. She controls that Bitcoin. Um, I can't get it back unless she wants to give it back. I can't get it back. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much it as far as uh, Bitcoin. I know I rushed through it. There's a lot more to it. Um, there's a lot more to the whole aspect of mining and verifying these transactions. Uh, I really encourage you to, to, to look more into it. But it's interesting because, you know, when you look at this world of uh, digital currency, you mentioned crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I mentioned this morning about the, uh, the Iceland em embracing this uh, digital currency, of, although that... Uh, it fluctuated, it went to the half, right? Yeah, I think half it dropped of the worth. 50%. It dropped 50%. But I think the future that I see, and I, this is probably a bold statement coming from me, but I think Iceland is one great experiment that's going to see that they're going to use this digital money to be able to, for citizens to, fi to finance these crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding projects around the world. So they have a first time opportunity to get on it. Yeah, I mean, in a so way, you, it's like you, voting. Exactly. It's, it's voting with money. So a country could very easily give each of its citizens uh, one cryptocurrency of whatever that, current, uh, that currency so is. So it's kind of more like a pre-mine type. Yeah, they could pre-mine it. Um, so, uh, yeah, we didn't get into mining so much. So they would basically give out one coin to every citizen, and then those citizens would then be able to vote with those coins in either an election or for funding or a whole variety of things. And right. actually, it's being used, Bitcoin is being developed as a, as a voting mechanism.